Welcome to this CUBE conversation. This is part of the second season of the AWS Startup Showcase, season two, episode one. I'm Dave Nicholson and I am joined with a very special guest, CEO and co-founder of Tidelift, Mr. Donald Fisher. Donald, welcome to the CUBE. Thanks, David, really glad to be here. So first, first and foremost, tell us about Tidelift. Happy to, yeah. So uh, at Tidelift, uh, we're on a mission. Uh, our mission is to make open source software work better for everyone. And when we say that, we mean make it work better for all the organizations and, and governments and everybody that depends on open source software to build the applications that we all rely on. But also part of our mission is making open source work better for the creators of open source, the uh, independent open source maintainers who are behind so many of those um, building blocks, technology building blocks that are commerce industry and society is com comprised of these days. Um, they've got a hard uh, a hard task to, to hold up all of that stuff and make sure that it meets um, you know, uh, professional grade uh, standards and, and that we can all rely on it. And so we want to do our part to help both sides of that equation. Fantastic. Well, I want to double click on a few of the things that you said, but I, I think I want to format this by starting out with a little role play between the two of us, if you don't mind. I know you're CEO, but for the for the for the sake of this, you're going to be the CIO, and I'm going to be the CEO, and we're we're going to play off some recent events here. So so hey, Donald, come on in, sit down. Um, listen, I want to talk to you about this whole log shell log for something or another thing that's going on. So so let me get this straight. Our multinational Fortune 500 company is dependent upon software that's free. And somehow we've been running this and the people who maintain it do it for free. We don't pay for it, but somehow this has opened us up to a threat from people who can log into a system we're using to keep track of stuff. And then what, what, what's, what's going on? By the way, you're fired, but I want to keep, I want to know if, uh, I want to know if you can stay on for the next 90 days to, uh, to train your replacement. But, but explain to me what's going on with this whole open source nonsense. Yeah, don't panic boss, um, it's only <laughs> about 70 or 80% of the software in our enterprise that is third party open source software. Um, it's so it's, there's, there's definitely like 20 or 30% that's, that's not. Um, and, and we're on top of it. Um, now, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you, you know, you're, you're right to say we are completely dependent on this software that's being created by these, um, you know, amazing folks on the internet. Um, Boss, you told me that we had to have a global corporation here with a modern digital uh, customer experience. We're not going to be able to do it using Microsoft front page from 1997. And there's nothing else, uh, <laughs> there, no other path to take than to build with modern uh, building blocks. And today in uh, you know uh, the modern era, that means building on uh, open source packages and technologies uh, across a whole slew of uh, language ecosystems like JavaScript and Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, .NET, Rust, Go. We use all of it here, boss, and uh, we, don't, we don't get to have a business unless we do. Okay, so I didn't understand a word that you just said, but it was enough to convince me to let you keep your job. So, uh, so end scene, uh, we're not getting paid scale <laughs> wages to do this, Donald, so I think we can go back to our, our normal personas. Okay. So, so how, do, how, how, does, uh, how does Tidelift play into all of this? Uh, I really want to hear about this concept of, a, of what an open source maintainer is, because these are largely volunteers, aren't they, in terms of the maintenance that they're doing? Yeah, so I mean, open source, there's a lot of different models for open source uh, software development. Um, there certainly are a number of foundational open source uh, projects, certainly at the infrastructure level, like operating systems, and databases, and things like that, that tend to be um, you know, predominantly driven by um, uh, vendors, software vendors, you know, like you can think of uh, uh, Red Hat, VMware organizations like that. Um, but when you get up to the application development um, world, uh, teams building, you know, websites, web applications, mobile applications, most of the building blocks at that tier in these uh, programming language ecosystems, um, most of the software there is actually being created, that, that enterprise organizations use is being created by individual uh, independent open source maintainers where it's it's not their day job. Um, it's, a, it's a side hustle for them. And it's a really interesting question, like how did we get here? It's, uh, you know, why, did, why are these folks doing it? 
it sort of rhymes with the question I asked myself years ago, like who's typing all this stuff into Wikipedia and why? Like it's an amazing resource. Uh, I'm so glad it's there, but why are they doing this, right? And it turns out that there, there's a bunch of motivations. There's some cynical motivations for, for the open source maintainers that people attribute that are practical too. You know, people say your GitHub repository is your resume in uh, as a modern developer. Um, uh, things like that helps you get a, a reputation. Uh, you can use that to get a to get a job. But when we've talked to the the maintainers of the most widely used um, open source packages, and, and by that I mean thousands of packages that every major organization that builds software relies on. The main reason why they do it is actually impact. We found we find we've actually done direct surveys of this audience, and um, the reason why they you know spend their nights and weekends and carve out time where they could be you know getting paid to do something else or um, going skiing or going to the beach is um, it really feels good to have this creative activity that they put out into the world, um, and you know they know that folks use this stuff and rely on it, and there's a pride there's a pride in their work and the impact that they're making. But the challenge uh, with this model is that when it's only an impact and, and pride and, and sort of uh, you know uh, a good feeling driven effort, uh, it, it means that maybe all of the things that organizations might want their um, standards that organizations might want their software to meet doesn't get done, right? Like it's one thing if you're, you've got a job as a software uh, engineer building corporate software or, or even as a you know a maintainer at a corporate open source company, and you have a checklist of you know standard enterprise software development, commercial grade software development tasks that you that you need to be completing. If you're uh, if you're doing it as a side hustle for for good reasons like impact and um, uh, you know releasing your creative juice, you might not get to some of the um, more boring aspects of commercial software engineering like security engineering and some of the documentation and uh, uh, release engineering and uh, you know making sure there's structured metadata around all the elements of it, and that's the gap that we're really trying to trying to fill um, at Tidelift by well, connecting how, these two audiences. How? Yeah, how how you've got to, you, you want to fill the gap, you want to connect the audiences, but 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 how do you how do you do that? Yeah, perfect. So we do it by paying the maintainers, paying the open source maintainers actual dollars uh, or the currency okay. of their uh, preference. And what we're paying them for is not just to sort of hack on their projects uh, or hack on their projects more. We're asking them to uh, help us ensure that the software that our, the organizations that we work with depend on meets certain specific concrete um, enterprise standards. And those standards fall into three categories, um, security, licensing, and maintenance. So on the security front, um, you know, a baseline standard there is making sure that um, we, we have known versions of the open source packages that are free of known defects, right? So there's like a catalog of uh, 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 known security defects that the industry uses called the National Vulnerability Database. Uh, you may have seen the terminology CVE referred to uh, in, in passing. Um, that's the identifier for these things. So we work with the open source maintainers to make sure that we've figured out, mapped out which versions of software packages are impacted by known security vulnerabilities. And then we also look forward and make sure that we have a plan in place for what happens in the future when there are security vulnerabilities. So, um, you know, co traditional commercial software, there's a security response team who's kind of standing by 24 seven ready to respond. And then there's a defined protocol of what's going to happen in terms of what's called responsible disclosure, telling the right um, folks in the right sequence that there is a vulnerability, causing there to be a patched version of the software available, communicating that through, um, you know, Traditional commercial software vendors uh, for uh, uh, you know years have been doing that internally. That doesn't exist by default for volunteer, um, you know, part-time open source, independent open source maintainers. So we okay, fill well, that gap yeah. and we pre-wire that with them to make sure that so, that first track security is uh, okay. So you're, so, you're, so you're paying them. Are you and your uh, your co-founders wealthy philanthropists that are just doing this, or what's the business model here? You yeah. now you're paying these people who are doing it for free. They're happy. Uh, yeah. But uh, but how does that translate into uh, a business model for Tidelift? Perfect. So the the work that they're doing, you know, I talked a little bit about security. We also do similar things on on those other attributes like uh, licensing, making sure that the um, licenses are completely accurate, and we kind of know who wrote the software, et cetera. And then maintenance: is it being proactively cared for going forward? Is somebody still on the case with these with these pro with these projects? Now, the result of of all of that work is we create a 
vetted catalog of known good open source releases that we vetted with the experts, often the individuals and teams that wrote the code in the first place, usually um, we vet that it meets these enterprise standards. That's a really useful uh, tool for organizations that are building with that. So the way that we convey that to organizations that are building software in a useful way is we have a, a SaaS uh, service, software as a, uh, as a service um, platform. Um, that's what Tidelift is. And basically the teams that, that use this stuff, they plug us into their software development process, typically alongside um, other tools that they might have like CI CD tools that are running tests on their application logic. They'll plug in Tidelift into their release um, process to ensure that those, the 70 or 80% of the software that they ship that comes from GitHub, comes from the Python package index or NPM or the Maven central repository for Java. We're vetting that that meets their enterprise standards and ensuring that the ingredients, the building blocks that go into their applications are, are known good and vetted to these concrete standards. And they are, you know, this is an unsolved problem for almost every serious organization. There's a couple of, you know, overperforming uh, organizations like Google has done some amazing internal work on this. Amazon has, a, has an incredible dedicated team that does this internally for Amazon developers. Very few other organizations, even some of the largest multinational companies have a dedicated internal function doing this comprehensively and systematically. Tidelift is that function that these organizations can use. They can work with us and our network, our unique network of hundreds of these independent open source maintainers to ensure that there's a feed of um, known good vetted packages to go into their into their applications. So, so are maintainers uh, going in and auditing and editing and vetting software that was essentially created by others? That's that's one that's one question, and then and then the other the other question that kind of goes along with that is, are they are you vetting a gold copy of something and saying, this software uh, meets certain criteria, you should feel okay using it. That's one thing. Validating that the actual distribution, you know, the actual code that's that's being executed in their enterprise um, is secure and hasn't been tampered with is another thing. So where do you where do you sit in that distribution channel or that supply chain? Sure, so on the, uh, on the, on the distribution front, um, you can think of us, we're sort of a uh, GPS system that your um, application developers can use to know which versions of uh, software are going to meet your enterprise standards. We don't create a separate world where we have our own you know, side copy of the entire um, development ecosystem. Uh, it's not what these organizations want. They don't want to use some weird enterprise world uh, set of open source packages. They want to just, you know, type npm install, have the, um, you know, software flow into their organization, but they also want it to not have known security vulnerabilities in it. And they don't want to get bitten two, week, two weeks or two years later with a license violation because there was kind of fuzzy uh, or incomplete data around the open source license. So what we do is we help them consume the open source software, uh, you know, knowing that it's been vetted to these standards. And then we also um, work with the open source uh, community to cause the software to be changed to meet those standards, right? So back to the first part of your question, um, we, we, we work with a lot of projects with the prime maintainers, often the authors, as I said, and we've actually been um, extending our model over the years to work with these open source maintainers to cover not just their own project, but some of those neighboring projects, right? Like the core um, projects that their project depends on, um, other projects that are co-used with them. They have a lot of expertise and also, you know, relationships with the, the surrounding open source community there. So they work, they, they, they're working with us as uh, curators, if you will, or ambassadors that help us get out in the community and cover as much of the landscape as possible. And so what's the relationship with AWS? This is, you know, we're, we're, we're talking here as part of the AWS Startup Showcase, season two, episode one, which is, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so we need to, you know, the, the challenge here is uh, season one was awesome, much like Ted Lasso. Season two, <laughs> We got we got we have big shoes to fill here, Donald. So what's the what's the uh, <laughs> what's the relationship with with AWS? And I mean, why would they why would they call you out as someone interesting for us to talk to? Yeah, so we, we've had a great relationship uh, that we've been investing in and, uh, and and working on together with uh, with AWS. So every one of AWS's customers faces this challenge around the software workloads that they're deploying on AWS. You know, it's just 
you can't argue against the fact that the vast majority of the application software in the modern world is comprised majority of this third party open source software. And so it's really important whether it's running on uh, a device, uh, you know, an, an edge device, or whether it's running in a cloud uh, data center that those applications uh, meet these standards, especially on the security front. So AWS recognizes this um, need and opportunity for their customers. Um, and so we've been working really well jointly with them. We're glad to say that we're an uh, ISV, an AWS ISV Accelerate partner now, which gives us the ability to uh, co-engage with, uh, with AWS and um, work together to solve uh, mutual customers' uh, challenges. And uh, we've had a great time uh, working with uh, the AWS team to help scale up our efforts to get the word, word out around this important uh, area. And then more importantly, give organizations the tools to address it and make sure that they have a comprehensive strategy for managing their open source in place. Fantastic, Donald, we're up against time, but I do have a 10 second answer I'd like from you. Uh, tide lift, is that a reference to a rising tide lifting all boats or is it an admonishment not to build a house on the beach in, uh, in uh, Malibu? It's the former, uh, you know, think about these, this network of independent open source maintainers working together, a rising yep. tide lifts all boats. Eight sec that, was, that was like four seconds, perfect. Donald Fisher from Tidelift, thank you so much. Uh, from me, Dave Nicholson here at theCUBE. This has been a CUBE conversation as part of AWS's Startup Showcase, season two, episode one. Come to theCUBE for the best in tech coverage. <laughs>